Welcome, Richard. Uh, very happy to have you here for our interview. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And you made a very interesting study in 2018, and it was about the relationship between nominal interest rates and economic growth. growth. And before we go into it, so what is the common view within economic profession and central banks of the relationship between interest rates and economic growth? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for, for actually raising this topic. Um, I mean, it is very central and fundamental to economics and monetary policy, but for some reason, people don't really talk about it much. So I'm glad you're raising it. Um, now, yes, so in answer to your question, um, economists famously disagree a lot. There's different schools of thought, different approaches, different opinions, economists always arguing, it all seems very confusing. However, there seems to be one issue on which essentially all schools of thought agree, which is quite, you know, interesting. That's fantastic. Namely, the question of the relationship between interest rates and economic growth. And you can go back to classical economists, you know, when modern economics started in England, Britain, uh, at the time, the leading economic, military and political power in the world, and also producing uh, what then became uh, henceforth the mainstream approach in later modern versions, but it started all with classical economics, David Hume, uh, David Ricardo, um, and others. And they already proposed this uh, relationship, namely lower interest rates lead to higher economic growth and higher interest rates, slow economic growth. And there's various reasons for that. The most obvious one being uh, with lower rates, investment gets attractive more investment will be stimulated um, for instance you can look at capital budgeting methods you know discounting net present value calculations so with lower interest rates more projects become viable you get more investment you get more economic growth now since the classical economists of course the same idea has been essentially reiterated by the neoclassical economists alfred marshall and others then by the Keynesians, they also have the same argument. And then um, after the war, the, the, the sort of post-war Keynesians, uh, Tobin, Hicks, and um, all those people, and, um, and, and later the monetarists, they still have the same argument, although they talk more about the money supply, but they also um, agree um, concerning the role of interest rates. And then, of course, we come to more present day um, economic theories, uh, new classical theories and supply side economics, um, the, the Woodford approach describing how central banks operate and how they focus on interest rates and um, essentially the present consensus, uh, central banks, you know, targeting either inflation rates or, you know, essentially moving interest rates in order to move the economy. And they all say low rates lead to higher growth, higher rates lead to low growth. You could say this is the, the law and the profits of um, modern economics. And actually, let's be precise, all this economics I've mentioned in the last 200 and odd years is uh, their versions of equilibrium economics, because the approach is actually very similar despite the fact that there's so many different schools of thought, actually they, they don't really differ that much. They all talk about equilibrium and demand equals supply, you know, market forces making sure that things are in equilibrium. And in equilibrium, prices are more important than quantities because it's the prices that move to give us the equilibrium. And of course the overarching price for the economy is the price of money, the interest rate. And therefore it's quite logical in this equilibrium economics from classical to neoclassical to new classical and modern day economics that you know it's it's all about the price of money the interest rate being the key variable and so quite naturally central banks of course have been reiterating this um for decades and and, and almost on a daily basis even now when they have quantitative policies they still say oh we may need to lower rates even into in negative territory say the fed or in the in the UK, this is being dis discussed, should we lower rates to negative territory because lower rates stimulate the economy and surely we want to stimulate the economy. So what you're saying that uh, this means that the monetary policy is actually aiming to use interest rates as the tool 
to stay at the economy, either to, to increase economic growth or decrease it. Precisely, exactly, as, 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 the, as you say. Okay, and that, that is in the core of every country. I think also to, you know, deliver it to central banks through interest rates to take care of the economy. Exactly, precisely. Wow, okay, if it's that important, then how many system, systematic studies of the relation between nominal interest rates and economic growth were made before you did yours in 2018? Exactly, and in fact, I ask that very question usually um, to my students when I introduce this topic. And, you know, first explain how all these economists have been saying this for the last 250 years, how central banks have been reiterating this claim of this link between interest rates and economic growth on a daily basis and how central and important it is. And then I asked them, so what do you think? You know, how many studies, empirical studies have there been? I mean, is it going to be in the 10,000s or thousands or, and of course the students, yeah, they give us, um, they give many answers. I mean, they're just guessing, but they all are very large numbers. Could be in the thousands over those, you know, many, many years and decades and even centuries. And of course, central banks are the biggest employers of economists in the world, employing thousands and thousands of economists. Um, and they produce research. And since this is a very central fundamental pillar of what central banks uh, claim to be doing, um, you can expect that there are just hundreds and hundreds of studies. And even if there's no recent studies, maybe at some stage, this has been so solidly empirically demonstrated that, you know, that, that it's therefore being proclaimed as the law and the profits in economics. However, the surprise is that when you actually search for such studies, um, you don't seem to be able to find them. And when we did our study, and then, of course, you always want to quote the literature and the existing related similar studies. Um, uh, we couldn't find any. We couldn't find any. So there hadn't been any empirical studies that have been published uh, on this question. Wow. None? None. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's really now, interesting. <laughs> now, having said that, um, I had already noticed when I was a student that when I um, looked at empirical papers, research published in journal articles, usually on various different topics, that whenever the role of interest rates came into play as one of the many variables in, an, um, in a model, sometimes there was, well, several times I noticed there's a footnote saying, oh, interest rates behaved surprisingly or they didn't really behave well they didn't conform to our theories or or you know we didn't quite get the result on interest rates that we expected and it was sort of hidden in a footnote but i noticed it over the years again and again um and of course that um you know got me thinking and and um i started already in the uh, in the 1990s to look at the empirical facts. Now, I didn't conduct a very thorough, detailed, systematic, long-term empirical study, but I just looked at the data, interest rates on the one hand and economic growth, and it, it really looked like it, the theory was, uh, was not correct. And um, it looked like reality is different from what we're being told. So there were these, you know, um, indications already and there were bits and pieces of knowledge out there indicating oh there's something maybe wrong here but because I, I think because it's such a fundamental relationship that's not only fundamental for uh, as the foundation of modern central banking but also of modern economics per se it seemed to me nobody dared to tackle this systematically and um, I think people were afraid this is too sensitive and um, the fact is, yes, we couldn't find any a proper empirical study of this issue. Wow. Wow. Well, that makes your study even more interesting, actually. So if you go over to your study, then what did you find? Um, well, we, first of all, we, we conducted it in, in a very um, careful way because, you know, we're aware that this is a controversial topic, apparently. <laughs> and yeah. uh, um, we can talk about that in detail 
exactly how we did this uh, in order to you know make this a very strong and robust empirical study with the latest econometric techniques um, and we tested for two things firstly is the correlation between interest rates and economic growth and of course the the theory for the last 250 years in equilibrium economics in which is really english language modern economics um, is that the correlation should be negative because it's lower rates and higher growth higher rates and lower growth so they're they're moving in an inverse relationship so it should be a negative correlation between the two and then it comes when it comes to timing or what what is called statistical causation ultimately you know we're talking about the real causation of course you know that's hard to prove statistically so it's more about the timing which one comes first and therefore is more likely to cause the other it's known as granger causality some kind of a statistical concept for causality the the theories say well rates have an effect on growth therefore there's a causation running from interest rates to economic growth so we're testing for these two dimensions the correlation and the causation and um, the expectation according to the mainstream theories is all of these theories should be a negative correlation and causation should run significantly from interest rates to economic growth so that was what we were testing and in a nutshell the finding is that the correlation is not negative it is positive so interest rates and economic growth are positively correlated and we found that there's uh, far more evidence of the causation to run from economic growth to interest rates than the other way around. In other words, our empirical finding is the opposite of these theories in, in both dimensions. So instead of the um, expectation and the claim that lower rates lead to higher growth, higher rates lead to lower growth, what we found is empirical evidence for, um, for the following relationship higher growth leads to higher rates lower growth leads to lower rates that's what the empirical data seems to suggest so it says that the economy is driving the interest rates and it's not the other way around exactly exactly wow that's quite interesting then so make me think that if because usually businesses they take they, they take out a loan if they believe in the future they're investing in and if they don't they don't take out the loan. Right? Yes, exactly. Well, but of course, there is this gap between micro and macro, you know, the individual case and the whole economy. And of course, ultimately, the whole, you know, all the players in the economy, they're also influenced by what's going on in the economy and their whole expectations um, are influenced by that. And of course, if since we found that um, the economy is driving interest rates, that raises a number of questions, such as, of course, obviously, well, can you then use interest rates as monetary policy tool? No. Well, why are central banks then going on about this and continue to claim against the evidence that they are using interest rates as monetary policy tool when this isn't even possible? But thirdly, it raises the question, OK, if rates don't drive growth, well, what then explains and drives and predicts economic growth? And once we understand that, then we can answer all these other questions questions and and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that as well if you want me to well let's let's get back to that i yes. think because i think yeah. that would be a very very interesting question to deep uh, to dig deeper into it so thank you for opening that door and let me get back sure. to you in another occasion okay sure so what you're saying is actually that the interest rates doesn't work as a policy tool that's that's uh, exactly but that's that's to put it mildly, a uh, revolution in making almost when you can. But so what reactions have you had on your study? Yes, absolutely. It is a revolution because what we found is that the one issue on which all these economic schools of thought within mainstream equilibrium economics for the last 250 years from classical economics and, you know, in the early 19th century to today on what they all agreed precisely that relationship is empirically wrong has been disproven by the data and doesn't actually exist in reality um, 
and I, of course i also then asked myself okay well where does this idea actually then come from that lower rates lead to higher growth and it turns out that it comes entirely from theory and it goes back to what all these approaches share which is their methodology they're all based on the so-called hypothetical um, axiomatic approach which uh, doesn't start with empirical facts to formulate theories as you do in physics and chemistry that's the inductive approach instead they say no we, we proclaim an axiom an axiom is something we know to be true for sure so much that we never have to check whether actually it is true and if we did check we would find it's not true that's an axiom <laughs> And then we add assumptions, which we know are not true anyway, but, you know, we don't mind. And then we build this theoretical fictional model. Um, and that's the equilibrium approach, you know, so we have this equilibrium of all markets, everything is wonderful. And in this wonderful theoretical world, we also find that prices are key because they give us equilibrium. So it's entirely theoretically based that's where this idea comes from so it's never been based on empirical reality but to come back to your question what how did people react to this study well first of all you should know that it was very hard to publish this in a in a ranked a serious you know highly ranked internationally reputed peer-reviewed um, economics journal the original study um, I produced um, in 2011 Oy. And um, it, it took it took ultimately seven years to get published. Um, you know, we also made massive improvements because we each time there was another rejection. We thought, okay, we have to strengthen this further and further and further. So of course, the end result is a much better and stronger paper than 2011. But the facts hadn't changed, and the facts are still the same. Namely, you know, empirical data is contradicting the story, the interest rate story. Um, so there was already a lot of resistance by uh, by journal editors and referees. Even once this journal accepted it, the referees accepted it. Then there were various attempts to to stop publication at the at short notice. So there's all sorts of things going on. And obviously, whenever I present this, um, there is a lot of you know debate and resistance to this idea. Um, I find that. For example, investors and people looking at the markets that are just interested in finding out what works and how does the world work, they're quite open to this idea and quite willing to accept it. But academic economists are quite resistant because it's so fundamental to everything they 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 believe. You know, it's it's really a belief system, um, and and this clearly contradicts their entire belief system. It's really a rejection of of the last 250 years of modern economics which is equilibrium economics and in my view it is actually empirical evidence that equilibrium economics is wrong uh, which was only ever based on on theories and assumptions anyway there's no evidence of equilibrium you know the real world economics is in my view disequilibrium economics uh, because we can't assume and we can't expect that markets are in equilibrium. You know, it's a nice idea, but, uh, you know, if you're interested in reality, you've got to look at the facts. I think that's quite interesting, but I, I would assume that uh, anybody who says that, okay, you're not right in your study, that you've done something wrong, they should be able to prove it actually with facts. <laughs> yes, yes. And of course, they're open to, to do that and challenge that, but that nothing has been uh, produced. And I don't expect anything will be uh, forthcoming contradicting our empirical study. Wow. Actually, I think, I think that's telling quite a lot. If you, you your study showed quite clearly the relationship between interest rates and uh, economic growth. And also the consequences of monetary policy, which challenge, you know, the foundations and everything that's going on today. And you actually give empirical uh, evidence for it. And no one steps up to challenge it with facts. But the only way to challenge it is with trying to keep it quiet. Yes, keep it quiet. I mean, initially it was suppression. Um, and and once it was out, then yeah, just uh, try to ignore it and keep it quiet and not engage in the discussion. Whoa, okay. 
So, Richard, thank you very, very much for your time and for sharing this information from your study. And to me, it, it is very important information to have out there so we actually know what the empirical facts says. Okay. Thank you very you much, much for taking your time and, and I'll get back to you later on. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.